The Stranger Things Podcast, episode number seven. The Bathtub. Lucas! Where are they? I, I don't know. I think we lost them. Go, 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 go! Go, No, Dustin, we missed it. I mean, that was, that was, that was awesome. It was awesome. Welcome to the Stranger Things podcast, a fan podcast dedicated to the original Netflix series... Stranger Things. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Daryl. And I'm Addie. How are you today? Pretty neat. (laughs) Me too. I just finished watching episode seven for the second time about five minutes ago, and I am really excited to be uh, talking about it. But I will tell you this, Addie, for the first time, this is not an episode that I liked better than the one before. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I loved everything about this episode. I was telling you, we went to, we were at the store yesterday and we were getting into the car and we were talking about it as we walked, you know, to the car. And and I said, you know, that episode, the first time I watched it, it ended and I was like, how, how'd that happen? I just pushed the play button like 10 minutes ago. It was one of those episodes that just went by so fast, which is Obviously, a, a sign of a well-written, well-constructed episode. So, I loved the episode, but not as much as I loved the preceding episode. And I'm really curious, too, to see when I rewatch the series, how they're all going to stack up. But anyway, good stuff for sure. Well, let's get into it. Uh, Eddie, why don't you tell us who wrote and directed this episode? This episode is written by Justin Doby and directed by the Duffer Brothers. Who are the Duffer Brothers? They are people who directed this episode of Stranger Things. Oh, okay. And how are they connected to each other? They're brothers. Ah, I think you're right. I think you're onto something. Well, as I said, thanks for joining us for this episode. Episode 7, the penultimate episode of the first season. I'm excited because as soon as we finish recording this, we're recording this on what, July the 6th. I'm excited because as soon as we finish recording this... I get to hit play and watch the season That's finale. what I was going to say. Okay. 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 You want to tell everyone how you woke me up this morning? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, you were already awake, but just barely. You'd been awake for like two minutes because your mom had gone in there. And I jumped on your bed and I was like, Addison, guess what today is? And you're like, I don't know. Thursday. No, no, no. Guess what today is? And then you said, I don't remember what you said after that. Uh, the day we record our podcast for episode seven yeah and then what did i say you were like you know what that means and i was like because we only have one episode left and you were like and you get to watch episode eight today (laughs) yeah that's right and you were like (laughs) tell them what you did Uh, well you were still laying down and and i so i was like i put my hands uh on your like your belly and i was like bouncing you up and down in your bed (laughs) that's right i get to watch the season finale today that means i don't have to avoid spoilers anymore it was really exciting for me lol (laughs) and you were just like get out of my room (laughs) that's true yeah i was looking over at mom for help yeah you were yeah you you mouthed help me several times yeah she did several times didn't work but she just anyway, stood there. I'm really excited to be talking about this episode for more than one reason. One is that one is I love the episode. Another is I love talking about Stranger Things. So we're going to spend the majority of our episode talking through the episode, things we liked and things that we noticed and, and stuff like that. Uh, before we do that, we're going to do the episode recap. And I think I forgot to mention in our last episode, I don't want to forget this time that the great folks over at the fan wiki are putting together those episode recaps. They're not doing them for us. It's uh, it's just something that we're using that they are putting together. So go check them out. You can find that over at strangerthings.wikia.com. Love the fan wikis. And so go check that out. Thanks to everyone who's a contributor over there. After we do our episode discussion, we're going to do a little quote of the week where Addison picks her favorite moment of the episode 
Then I've got uh, just one prediction for this episode. Then we're going to do some news and rumors and close it all out with the Mame of the Week. The Mame of the Week. just saw for the first time and I'm... (laughs) That's really good. Yeah. Except that should not be that person. It should be another person. And instead of saying life, it should say van. Uh, wouldn't that be funny? You'll have to wait and see what the meme of the week is when we get there. Maybe that'll make sense. All right, yeah, Addy, it's still not funny though. Let's get into the episode recap. Mike and Eleven are sharing an intimate moment in the basement bathroom when Dustin bursts through the door, telling them that Lucas may be in trouble. Over the radio, Lucas warns them that the bad men are coming. They then leave on their bikes as they are pursued by Brenner and various other Hawkins lab agents. During the chase, they reunite with Lucas but soon find the agents aren't far behind. As they are trying to get away, one of the vans blocks their path. Eleven uses her powers to flip the van, ensuring their escape. Reaching their junkyard base, Lucas apologizes to Elle for calling her a traitor, and in turn, she apologizes for lying. Mike also apologizes and Lucas accepts his handshake. Hopper and Joyce arrive at the police station and demand Callahan and Powell release Jonathan. The officers refuse and reveal the stash of hunting gear in Jonathan's trunk. Hopper demands to know why he had such items, but Jonathan claims he wouldn't believe him. Brenner and his agents arrive at the Wheeler house. As they begin searching the residence, Connie Frazier speaks with Karen and Ted. She asks them if they know anything about Eleven, to which they respond, no. Karen then becomes furious, demanding to know why they are there. Brenner then steps in, telling her that her son is in danger and asking where he is. At the junkyard, the kids are discussing Hawkins' laboratory when they notice helicopters overhead. They decide to take refuge in an abandoned bus. Back at the police station, Nancy and Jonathan tell Hopper about the monster. As Joyce and Jonathan have a conversation in the hallway, Hopper steps out of his office when he overhears an argument between Callahan and a woman. The woman is revealed to be Troy's mother, who's there to report his arm had been broken by another child. Hopper becomes interested when Troy describes the girl's appearance, and he asks for more information. Troy tells him about her abilities, and that she's always with Mike, Lucas, and Dustin. Meanwhile, Steve is with Tommy and Carol in the parking lot of Fairmart. When Tommy and Carol make crude insults about Nancy, Steve finally has enough. They have a falling out, and Steve drives away. While surveilling the agents swarming her house, Nancy becomes worried about Mike. Hopper tells her they haven't found him yet and asks where he is. She doesn't know, but Jonathan claims to know a way to find out. Hopper, Joyce, Nancy, and Jonathan go to the buyer's house, where they use Will's walkie-talkie to contact the kids. However, they debate over whether they should answer, fearing it could be a trap. As Hopper is about to give up, Mike answers and tells them their location. At the Hawk, some employees are cleaning the marquee when Steve arrives. He asks if he can help and begins removing the graffiti from the sign. In the bus, the kids anxiously wait for Hopper. When they hear someone arrive, they quickly scramble to the front of the bus. Upon seeing that it's agents that have arrived, they quickly go back to hide. Before the agents can enter the bus, they are knocked unconscious by Hopper. He then urges the kids to come with him. Hopper and the kids meet up with Joyce, Nancy, and Jonathan at the buyer's house. Mike, Dustin, and Lucas explain the upside down, telling them that Will and Barb are trapped there. When Eleven fails to find Will and Barb, she proposes that she can find them in the bath. Dustin calls Mr. Clark, asking the requirements for a makeshift isolation tank. The group travels to the middle school, setting up a kiddie pool and filling it with de-icing salt. Eleven enters the pool, delving into a deep, psychic state. She first finds Barb's corpse, witnessing a slug slither from her mouth. This causes Eleven to break down and scream. After she is comforted by Joyce, she finds Will hiding in the upside-down version of Castle Byers. She tells him that his mother will be coming for him, and he tells her to hurry. Suddenly, Eleven loses contact, and Will vanishes. Hopper and Joyce decide to go to Hawkins' lab in order to get Will back. Nancy and Jonathan resolve to kill the monster and steal their hunting gear back from the police station. 
Hopper and Joyce attempt to break into the lab, but are apprehended by agents and security guards before they are able to enter the building. In the Upside Down, an incapacitated Will is shown singing in Castle Byers as the monster breaks in. Alright, episode recap over. That means it's time to talk about this bad boy. You know what I'm looking forward to before we break into this episode? I am looking forward to episode 8 with you because for the first time, you and I will be on equal footing. All discussions are on the table. You don't have to worry about not spoiling me. You're going to make your own predictions in the next episode. I what? can't wait for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's only fair. <laughs> mm. So be thinking about that. But let's talk about this episode. Uh, starts out in the Wazowski house. The Wheelers. My, that's what I said. Mike and Elle are, are they in the bathroom? Where are they at? I think they're in the bathroom and like in the basement where when they first meet Elle. Or, yeah. Well, in episode two, whenever they give her the clothes to change into. Yeah. I yeah. think that's the bathroom that she was changing in. I think that's right. Yeah. That scene was hilarious. The changing scene? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I, thought you, I thought you meant this scene, because Justin's funny in this scene, too, because it looks like Elle and Mike might be fixing to do a little smoochy smooch, and Dustin breaks in. I know. Dustin, Dustin, stop. This is the, this is the one scene I don't like with him in it, even though Dustin's my favorite character, and he will always be my favorite character. Uh-huh. So you wanted to see Mike and Elle kiss? Of course. Oh, Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know that I do. I mean, not, not, I'm not saying ever, just not yet. Just not yet. So I was okay with the way it played out. You can see there's a little bit of attraction there. Obviously Mike's been attracted to her from, from the very beginning. She looks pretty neat or whatever it was. He good. said, he good. Said good. good. Oh, yeah. So he's, you know, there's, and he's even been teased about it, but not yet. It needs to build up a little bit more. So this was good though. I like the way they handled it. Okay. The rest of this scene though at the house is really, really good. I love the opening and love the, the ending of this episode. Again, just love the episode in general. Lucas is on the walkie talkie and yelling for them saying the bad men are coming. Uh, and then you have them recognizing there's a strange van outside and Mike goes to talk to his mom to see if she has some sort of uh, work scheduled for her or service scheduled or something for that day. Like work to be done on the house or something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah. Because it said like power and energy, something like that mm-hmm. on the side of the van. Yep. Another funny scene. And I don't know who's funnier in this scene, if it was Dustin or Mike, because they're both pretty freaking hilarious with what they're doing. I love when Dustin makes eye contact with the dude in the van. Like, he's just like, <gasps> and like, I don't, I love that part. Uh, he, he just looks so scared and he's like, Mike, we need to leave right now. And like mm-hmm. the, he says it like really dramatically. Yeah, exactly. Now, uh, if I'm the mom, I mean, what, what do you think? Cause I mean, the boys are clearly acting weirder than even normal, but she's going to find out pretty quickly, but yeah, pretty crazy. The only thing crazier maybe is the ensuing van chase slash bicycle chase. Again, one of these scenes that reminds you of ET because the scientists are chasing the kids on their bikes at one point, ET's in the basket. And then of course ET makes them fly. Uh, in this case, something does fly, but it's not the kids nor is it E.T. Uh, I don't know. I thought it was a really fun and exciting scene. What about you? I think it was really awesome whenever she made the van flip and uh-huh. then it just like breaks and then they're, they're all just like, did you see that? That was awesome. Like the, the look on their faces, they're just like, whoa. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. I love the visual effect. They did a great job when it looked real. You know, too bad it wasn't Brenner's van, but of course it wasn't Brenner's van. He's not going to be in the crashed van. Um, he just, what, what what I thought was weird, but I guess I shouldn't thought of, have thought it was weird was Brenner and the other guys get out of their vans and no one's going to check on the guy or guys that were in the crashed van. They're all instead just standing there looking at the kids get away. Meanwhile, your, your buddies over here are probably bleeding out on the street. Nice to know you care. But they don't care. Exactly. They don't. 
So then they get to the, what are we calling this? The junkyard? Is that a good name for it? I don't know. And you and I talked about this scene a little bit at dinner tonight. Um, because of you, you got me really paying attention to the soundtrack on Stranger <laughs> Things. Because you, you listen to it all the time. I don't know how many times you've listened to it, but it seems like you're listening to it at some point just about every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I because of you, I recognized that when they get to the junkyard, Lucas comes over to Elle, apologizes to her. You know, she says, friends, friends don't lie. Because she had lied to them, so she apologizes for that. And then Mike and Lucas shake hands. And it was kind of right in the midst of that, that you see, you hear the music kick in. And it's called Kids 2, is the name of that song. And uh, I, as soon as it kicked in, I was like, oh my gosh, it's the music. And so, anyway. Which is my favorite song. because thanks, it's thanks, the Abby. It's the song that plays in my favorite scene, which is in episode four. The make it's the makeover scene whenever they, you know, give Eleven a makeover. Yeah, so, yeah. Scroll, scroll down to the bottom. Scrolling down to the bottom. <laughs> Very nice. That's pretty good Photoshop there. Not really, but it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> that is, I guess we should explain. That is some uh, Photoshop that. They have, it looks like they've taken the original 1980 whatever E.T. with Elliot and E.T. in the basket and whoever was in the bike behind him and they've photoshopped Dustin in the background and then Lucas, you can see he's been, his face is photoshopped on somebody and then Mike's face is photoshopped on what would have been Elliot's uh, face from E.T. and then L is in the basket under the blanket like E.T. would have been. That's really funny. I think I've seen that before, but... Never. Well, you were just talking about it earlier, so yeah, figured I figured I should put it didn't there. didn't know the context until until now, so anyway, good stuff. Okay. Wait, yes. is that actually Dustin's Photoshop face, or is that the actual kid who looks exactly like Dustin from E.T.? I don't know. Well, no, it's not Dustin. It's not the right hat, is it? No. Yeah, it's got to be the original. It just looks like Dustin from that, from that little view we have. <laughs> okay. So we, there's a couple of things that happened this episode. I'm not going to touch on it just now, but this is kind of one of those, but I'll, I'll make the point about it later. But at the police station, so Hopper uh, and, and Joyce, I think we saw in the last episode that they needed to come to the police station because it was about Jonathan. Mm-hmm. Uh, either, that might've been this episode. I'm getting a little bit confused, but anyway, they, they show up, Jonathan's there and, uh, and then Nancy, of course, is there too. The really interesting thing, though, is the bully shows up. And which bully is this? Troy. Troy. Um, with his mom. And Hopper's trying to get rid of him. But then the bully mentions something about the creepy girl with no hair or, or shaved head. And uh, turns out to be some really useful information. Yep. Ex- except that even in that scene, even with all the adults around, Troy still being punk and calling them all the weirdos and losers. I know. Like, even everyone I know, even whatever they're, like, really rude, like, with no other, you know, like, parents and teachers around or, you know, adults. I mean, they're they're not rude with adults around, but, like, this kid doesn't know where to stop. Exactly. It's like, and I'm exactly with, with you. It's like, you know those kids that are jerks, but then the adults around, and they act like they're little angels. Yeah, clearly he doesn't care. Yeah, and his, his mom, his mom seems all, seems all proper and stuff, and then uh-huh. like she she looks like all proper and stuff, and then she actually like you know starts talking, and then you realize you you know where Troy gets it from. <laughs> That's right. Yep, apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Okay, let's talk about what happens at the was um, Wazowski house after. The boys leave because the parentals uh, finally get clued in a little bit on what's been going on. And they still don't believe it. No, that's why I say a little bit because there's still a lot they don't know. Like I, they still haven't met L and stuff like that. So I, I'm assuming that's going to happen at some point. But and then even later in the episode when they're trying to figure out is Nancy involved in this? Nancy with Mike? No. You know, they're just completely clueless. But uh, Karen does find the blanket fort and a piece of the wig. And then that's when the, I've, I've got a new name for them. And I, surely I'm not the first to come up with this. I'm calling them the scientists, the lab rats. 
Like that Disney XD show? <laughs> well, that's true. Because, you know, rats are usually, you know, something that's icks, that makes people sick or they're icky or they're dirty or nasty, you know, whatever. And then they're from the lab. So they're the lab rats. All right. You like that? Can we go with that? Sure. Are I don't you on care. board with that? Okay. So the lab rats show up. They start telling the parentals about the stuff that's been going on. And uh, Brenner says that Mike is in danger and asks for their trust. And of course, you and I know Brenner. And it's just, he just sounds like a sleazeball, doesn't he? Like when he's describing, you know, how much they, they Mike is in danger and they need to, tr- I need you to trust me, you know, all these other things. And just his tone. And I don't know how they can trust him. He sounds creepy. Yeah. Yeah. And later we get a scene between them. They're staring out the window. This is the same scene, I think, when she says, you don't think Nancy's involved in this, do you? That it seems like Karen doesn't trust Brenner. And the dad, what's the dad's name even? Do you know? Ted. Ted? Yeah, he's just like, well, it's our government. We've got to trust them. So... He's dumb. <laughs> yeah, he really is. And so whenever they are um, talking with the um, Dr. Brenner, or it might have been the girl. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, a girl's been hanging out in your basement or whatever. The dad is like, Mike with a girl? No way. Like, he doesn't even... he. He doesn't even think that his son has skills, you know, to talk to a girl. Like, that is, I, that makes me really mad. I want to punch their dad in the face. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, he may not think that Mike really has much interest in girls yet because he's, you know, he's very active with his, his guy friends and doesn't maybe express a lot of interest in girls. Well, that's because none of them have superpowers. So, except for, you know, Eleven. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it is funny, though, when the dad says that. It's not funny. It's rude. (laughs) It is rude, but it's funny. It's not funny. (laughs) All right, fine. Okay, let's talk about Steve. Ew. Got a little bit of Steve in this episode. First time we see him. I don't remember his jerk friend's names. I really shouldn't know these Tommy names. Tommy and now. Carol. Thank you. I just I depend on you to know them. That's really sloppy of me. I'll I'll step it up. Please. I depend on your notes to do mine, so <laughs> it evens out. Hey, we're a team. Yay. Um You said Tommy and what? Carol. Carol. I was gonna say Carol. I thought no, it's Karen. I'm I'm getting the names confused again. Uh Steve finally tells them off. And you and I were talking in the, I think last week about how Carol just never shuts up. You just want to punch her in the face. Mm -hmm. And she just starts blabbing on again. Steve finally has enough of it. Tells both of them off. And they try to like justify their behavior, you know, making it sound like Steve's the bad guy in this whole situation. And I'm like, for the first time, Steve's actually doing Something good. I I mean, you could technically say when he apologized to Nancy a couple episodes ago, but I always felt like that apology was really kind of... Fake? Half, yeah. It wasn't fully sincere. It was more just he felt like it was the thing he needed to do to, you know, get her back the way he wanted. It wasn't really a sincere apology. This obviously was sincere. So I say this is the first good thing we've seen out of Steve. I still don't like him. Yeah, I, um, I'm with you there. Whenever he's like telling them to be quiet, he's like actually had enough of it because weren't they like making fun of Nancy or something? Yeah, well, yeah, the, the the guy was talking about how basically she had it coming. Well, yeah. And then so he didn't like that he was talk, talking about Nancy like that. So he starts saying, oh, don't don't say this stuff like that. And, you know, he tells Tommy to shut up or and Carol it was one of them and then they're like oh he's overreacting like they think he went too far and like no he just told you guys to shut up because like all of us has been wanting to yeah so, <laughs> yeah cuz literally no one likes him so. yeah you're exactly right so that was good that we and a few a few minutes after that we see Steve it's like it's almost like he left that little gas station they were at and then drove straight to the movie theater where he just shows up and starts 
he volunteers to clean the paint off. And the guy's like, aren't you the one that did this? And anyway. No, he didn't He didn't actually admit to doing it. He's He just said, I want to help. Yeah. Like, he didn't say, yeah, I was the one that did it. Can I help you? But no, he he didn't want to take the blame for it. Well, it sounded like the other guy is the one that did it because at the gas station, Steve was like, I should have taken that paint can and shoved it down your throat. But still, he's responsible for it. He, he, he knew it was going on. So, yeah. Second good thing we've seen out of Steve. Is this going to be a... A new Steve? Is he is he turning over a new leaf? Is he going to be likable? He will never be likable. He could he could do all the good things in the world, and I still won't like him. Huh. Well, you and I talked about that Funko Pop character two episodes ago, mm-hmm. and then last week I said, "Oh, now I know how he got beat up on that Funko Pop." Well, there was something else on that Funko Pop that I didn't say last week because I didn't want to spoil those who. Still haven't seen the Funko Pop. Still haven't seen, you know, at that point, episodes seven and eight. So there's still one other component with that Funko Pop that I still haven't figured out. Must be must be something that will be revealed to me next episode. But it does give me the impression that perhaps St- Steve, at least for the time being, will continue his uh, good streak. His continue his streak of good streak. How do you like that? <laughs> Anyway, you know what I'm trying to say. We'll see. We'll All find right. out. But I, you know, I'm not saying I like Steve or anything like that. I'm just saying this is the kind of behavior I can I can support. <laughs> so we're done with Steve. And I've got some good. really good stuff to talk. The rest of this stuff, I think, is going to be really exciting stuff. So the kids, uh, they wind up at the junkyard. Like, that's where we last left them. They're, they're hiding in the bus. And they get a call. Uh, because after, okay, at the, at the police station, after they learned about L, what the bully told them, then all of them kind of decide they need to figure out where Mike is. He's in danger. And, and we see Hopper and Nancy kind of overlooking her house and realize, you know, the lab rats have been there. So they're trying to get a hold of him. Uh, Jonathan has the idea to go find the walkie talkie. Brilliant idea. Uh, that works. And so they get a call from Hopper, well, Nancy first, and then Hopper steps in. And they don't know whether to believe them or maybe whether they're reaching out to them. You know, it's a trap type of thing. This was a funny scene for me because Dustin, you know, first brings up the uh, the Star Wars reference, you know, mentions Lando. Do you remember, do you know the Star Wars connection there with Lando Carvacian? Well, I know it was from Star Wars, but I didn't get the reference. In The Empire Strikes Back which would have come out in 1980. Lando used to own the Millennium Falcon. Uh, Han Solo won it from him. And so, but he and Han are kind of friends, kind of rivals, kind of, kind of friendly. They're not even frenemies. They're, they're closer than that. But anyway, Han and the gang, Luke, Leia, they all need someplace to kind of hide. So they decide to go to Cloud City where Lando is like the governor of this Cloud City. And... Unfortunately, Darth Vader and his stormtrooper goons have shown up just before Han and Luke and Leia. And Lando doesn't give them any indication that he's there. And so he welcomes them and da-da-da-da-da, they're hanging out. And then he's like, hey, let's go in here and have some dinner. And the door opens and there's Darth Vader. And they're all captured and it was it was a trap. So that's what that's what he's saying here. It's like you know, Lando being Hopper, you think is your friend, but he's actually being controlled. You know, he's he's actually under the power of Darth Vader. And, you know, he's kind of being forced to act like he's your friend in this situation to lure your, r- lure you right into, right into him. Right. So that's what Dustin was talking about. It's, it's Lando. It's, you know, whatever. But I have to admit this scene disappointed me a little bit, but I think I'm hoping it was intentional. Uh, Dustin says, I don't feel good about this. Now, there's a famous line that appears in every single Star Wars movie. Do you know what it is? I've got a bad feeling about this. Yes. Congratulations on reading my notes. (laughs) Yeah, it's either I've got a bad feeling about this or I have a bad feeling. It's used interchangeably. I have a bad feeling about this or I've got a bad feeling about this. That would have been the perfect line, Dustin. Instead of saying, I don't feel good about this, he should have said, I've got a bad feeling about this. 
you let Dustin be. Don't he's doing it perfectly. Just no. <laughs> but I, I'm guessing the writers didn't want to be like total Star Wars here. I'm hoping. I don't know. I would have liked to have seen them say, him say, I've got a bad feeling about this. That would have been perfect. Whenever you first said something about how um, this scene like disappointed you or whatever. Yeah. Um, I thought you were talking about how like you wanted them to get captured. <laughs> <laughs> what? I was like, dad, what is wrong with you? <laughs> yes. I wanted them to get captured. What? Do you really thought that? <laughs> yes. Wow. <sighs> Man. You disappoint me that you would think that of me. You don't even know me. Boo-hoo. All right. So Hopper shows up, takes out the lab rats, and then this show does something that is crazy, off the rails, unprecedented. Because, yeah, Hopper, Joyce, Jonathan, Nancy, Mike, Dustin, Lucas, and Eleven, they all get together and actually, like, talk and discuss like what they know about the situation and like in a lot of shows they don't do that that's exactly right and earlier when we were talking about the police station i said i'm going to hit on this note later that's what i that that's what i was going to talk about i mean joyce because at the police station joyce and jonathan and hopper get together and compare their notes and nancy and that was good but now we have the entire gang i told you while we were shopping yesterday like if they had done that on lost like if they had gone around the campfire at night and said hey what happened to you today who'd you talk to what'd you discover in the jungle and they compared notes like two whole seasons could have got cut out of that show did you really want two seasons cut out no i didn't but i'm just saying there were so many times where it was like if you would just talk to each other you wouldn't have got yourself into this mess you're in right here. So anyway, it's I love it that the writers are acting like these people actually have brains and they know how to use them and they know how to communicate and they know how to work together as a team. It's unheard of and I like it. <laughs> so, cuz now they can write situations where that are based on the team trying something and and it you know, probably doesn't go according to plan. That's fine. But it's much better to do that than to have everybody doing these things on their own without communicating. Having said that, of course, the show ends or the episode ends with them kind of doing their own things and not fully telling each other about it. So we'll see how long the, the teamwork stays together. But anyway, I loved it. It was great. So what do we learn in this scene? So Eleven goes to the bathroom and whenever she's in there she notices the bathtub and she's like okay i can find barb with the bathtub and they're like all right time to build an isolation tank so dustin over here just calls the science teacher at like 10 o'clock at night um poor mr clark he is trying to make his moves on his girl and <laughs> dustin's interrupting his date I know that was pretty funny. Because <laughs> <It was> awesome. <laughs> Mr. Clark was like, okay, let's talk about this Monday. Kind of looking over at his day, you know. <laughs> and Dustin is like, why are you, why are you um, closing this <laughs> yeah. door? <laughs> and um, he like turns it back on him. And I think that's hilarious. Dustin is awesome. Yeah. And he he gets what he wants. He's very persuasive. You know, Mr. Clark, he's he's like um, uh, on Gilligan's Island, you had the professor, right? I know the Gilligan's Island is even before my time, but it was a, where they crashed on the, they're shipwrecked on this, you know, tropical island. And this guy was the professor. And it was like, just because he was a professor, he knows everything about everything. And I, I you know, Mr. Clark seems to be that way. It's like, Mr. Clark, you're sciencey. You must know about this, how to build an... And it's one thing to know about an isolation thing. Like I, I told you what I know about them a couple well, weeks he's ago. Well, he's also like a... He's also kind of nerdy. So, he he knows how to do that stuff. Like, in episode five, mm -hmm. uh, whenever he's explaining the flea and the acrobat. Yeah. Um, like, he knows exactly how to do that because he's like a nerd. He knows how to do that stuff. He's done actual research because he's a nerd. Maybe so. I mean, I'm not saying it's outside the realm of possibility. I'm just saying it was a little bit convenient. But, you know, Mr. Clark reminds me of Mr. Delp from your 
your old middle school. Mr. Delp was the science teacher, that one of the science teachers there, and also was the coach of the academic team, so we got to know him through that. But he was also just really cool just to talk to. I don't know if you ever did that because you're – maybe you, you didn't, but he and I did. We, from time to time, we would just chat, and he's kind of geeky. And, and anyway, it just reminds me a lot of, of Mr. Clark. And Mr. Clark is more like a friend to them than yeah. a teacher. Yeah, yeah. And, I don't, you know, obviously I don't have the relationship with – Mr. Delp that Colby does as being on an academic team and having him as a teacher, but you could tell he really cared about those kids and then it wasn't just a job to him. He would do anything for them. And Mr. Clark strikes me as the same way. So anyway, I like Mr. Clark a whole lot. So Dustin gets the information he needs and they, a lot of, quite a bit of time spent just getting the resources together to, to build the tank. I don't think we need to cover any of that. But. Oh, um, sorry. Going going back to the phone conversation. Yeah. Whenever Mr. Clark asks why they're doing this, Justin's just like, fun? Yeah. I, I, that's hilarious to me. He's just like, okay, yeah, we're doing this for fun. And he doesn't ask any more questions, I guess. Yeah. Because teenage boys building an isolation tank at 10 o'clock at night on a Saturday. On a Saturday, right. Yeah. I loved when Dustin, uh, you know, he got the information and now he's trying to get him off the phone. And I don't know if you've ever done this, like you're talking with somebody and you think you you think you're done. You're like, okay, bye. And then they say something else, but you're already in the motion of putting the phone down. So you just kind of take the phone up to your mouth. Like you don't put it back up to your ear. You just kind of put it sideways up to your mouth and go, okay, thanks. Have you ever done that? No. Oh man. I've done that so many times. Dustin does that in this uh, episode. Which Most thought, of the time whenever I'm done talking and the other person keeps talking, I'm just like, okay, 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 <laughs> okay, okay, I get it. Bye. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. So they build the isolation tank or the deprivation tank, whichever name you want to go with here. And the, and, and L boy, she gets in and gets into that kind of, space almost immediately it seems and she encounters barb barb looks dead she even says barb is dead no she says gone i thought she said dead the first time and then gone but i wasn't real clear on the first time the second time you're absolutely right she definitely said gone then yeah and then nancy's just like no Mm Hmm. pretty sad because, you know, Nancy was being a really bad friend and then the, her, and then yeah. Barb just died. So they ended like that. And that's just like really sad to know that they ended like in the middle of a fight. And mm-hmm. that's, that's sad. I'm a little bit confused because during the intro to, was it the Golden Globes last year or the Emmys? There was a huge production opening of the show. And in in one of the things that was part of that was Barb, like she came out of the swimming pool. Yeah, and Eleven was rapping. Yeah, my name is Eleven. I'm twenty four seven eating egg and waffles. <laughs> wow, I don't remember all that. I do. I just remember Barb popping out, and I didn't know who it was. I didn't think anything of it, but and I don't know if it was you or online some because we have so many geeky friends online. It, somebody remarked about Barb. Does that mean she's alive? And for whatever reason, that of all things, of all the Stranger Things things that I've seen, things, I, things, <laughs> yeah, I have forgotten ninety percent of it, thankfully. But that one thing has stuck in my head, and so now I'm like, oh, Barb looked pretty dead. I don't know. So I'm, I, you know, if I were to make a prediction with no knowledge, I would say she's dead. She's absolutely dead. No question. We saw her. She's dead. She's decaying. So I'm going to stick with that. Even though I've got that other thing in my head, uh, I'm just going to s- stick with she's, she's I'm dead. pretty sure she's dead too, but they might have just, you know, since she was going to be at the award show, mm-hmm. um, it would make sense to put her in the video. And since everyone loves her and she's like a small character, but a big character since everyone you know, thinks about her and, um, they turned, you know, just a side character into someone that is a little more important. So it makes sense to put her in the video and say, Barb is still alive. Mm -hmm. I'd go for that. I could go for that. Okay. 
So Barb is dead. Elle freaks out. This might be my favorite part of the episode because we've seen Elle freak out a few times. It seems like every time she goes into that nether region, whatever that is, you know, she freaks out. So she sees something, whether it's the monster, the first time when she wasn't sure what it was. And then of course we saw her completely freak out when she touched it and it turned around, but she, it, it never ends well for her. Right. And this is going the same way. She sees Barb. Barb is dead. And she starts to freak out. Joyce is the mom. She's the only mom there. All the others are either kids or, the, you know, Hopper's a dad. But, you know, you know, there's a difference between you, your mom and I. We, we, she's, when you're sick, you don't go to me. That's true. You know? You go to me for other things. But, you know, your mom... And, and most ladies are this way. They are so gifted in that area. And Joyce is the same way. Yeah, she's and treating Eleven like she's her own daughter. She is. She starts comforting her and speaking positive words to her and reassuring her and letting her know that. And then the others around it, they notice that and they start doing the same thing. And Elle calms down. And I just, I loved this so much because Eleven has always felt like I mean, she's in an isolation tank, but she, she, you know, she feels like she's alone. There's no one else like her. She's a freak or she's a monster, right? You know, and she, when she goes into these places, it's up to her. No one else but her can do this and go there and see what she sees and communicate back. She is alone. But with Joyce here in this scene, you know, she's letting her know she's not alone. We're with you. And then everyone else chimes in. And this is, this is family. This is what family does. And this is what you do when you, when you're a team and you're working together. It was just, it was awesome. It was just such a nice contrast to what Elle has experienced every other time that she's gone into that space. So, and it all starts with Joyce. So again, Joyce just continues to be one of my favorite characters. And this is probably my favorite scene with Joyce so far, although her and the, the light ball was pretty awesome too. But this was wonderful. My, probably my favorite moment of the episode. Cool. Okay. So, Elle regathers herself, continues to look, and now she finds... Will. Oh, I didn't really write any notes about Will. So I noticed that, so yeah. I wasn't... That's weird. I was like, did this happen in the next episode, or... <laughs> yeah. So, we don't really see a whole lot about Will. I mean, she, she, she sees him. She's there with him. She's, she's talking actually, with him. Yeah, talking to him. Mm -hmm. And she's trying to, like, comfort him and stuff. And he obviously looks scared and, like, half dead. Mm -hmm. She says, your mom is coming. And then they can hear him talking through the walkie-talkie. That must be, like, a big relief to Joyce. Like, getting yeah. to hear Will's voice and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. For, fortunately, probably for Joyce, she has no idea what happened next. So after L leaves or gets whisked away, and this is how the episode ends, the Demogorgon shows up and you get the jump scare end to the episode of it coming into it and, you know, it looks like it's destroying, destroying the yeah, Castle Byers. Did you jump? I don't know. I might have gotten used to it, but I'm sure it was still like... You know, like start only. Yeah, start was a good way to put it. Until I knew it was coming, you know, and he's kind of creeping around. You had those those low rumble growl things, gurgles, and you you know it's coming. But yeah, it's, it's still startling when you when you see it. Okay, we but we also have the two other things we kind of mentioned it already. Uh, Hopper and Joyce go to the lab. Uh, Jonathan and Nancy decide they're going to finish what they started. Go back out to the woods, and. That's kind of where the episode ends. I mean, Hopper and Joyce get captured at the lab. Um, and Jonathan and Nancy decide they're going to go back out there. End of episode. Such a good ending. The whole thing, from the point where Elle gets into the isolation tank, all the way through to the jump scare. The episode was so, so good. And I, like, yelled at the computer when it was over, because... It only been 10 minutes and I want more. So yeah, great episode. I was very sad whenever I watched the end of episode seven and I was like, or it might've been episode eight. And I was like, oh, 
okay, time for the next episode. And then I finish episode eight and I'm like, time for the next. Oh, what? What? <laughs> Where's the next one? There better be an episode nine. But there wasn't. No. So I just kept rewatching it. How many times have you seen the series? Because I remember when, okay, when we started our podcast, episode zero, at that point, you said you'd seen the entire uh, series season uh, one time through and then up through like episode two or something like that, three, you had seen it a couple of times. And then the first episode, you'd seen even more times than that. But since we started the podcast, you've watched the entire series, I think, two more times, at least. I've probably watched the entire, like the entire one or the entire season one at least six times. Yeah. Um, And then, of course, the earlier episodes, I've seen them more than the other ones. And then um, sometimes, sometimes whenever I'm like working on my notes and stuff um, in the blog posts. I'll watch the entire episode. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I just skip through it depending on. Yeah. I mean, if it's episode four, then, you know, of course I'm going to watch my favorite one. So. Yeah. All right. Any other thoughts on the episode? Nope. All right. Me either. Let's move into notes from the upside down, which is the listener feedback section. <laughs> Well, Addy, we've got two feedbacks to share for this episode. The first one is a first-time feedbacker to this podcast. I teased it last week. Here it is. It's Jason. I think you're going to like this one. Hi, Daryl and Addy. This is Jason in San Jose sending in some feedback for the Stranger Things podcast. First of all, I wanted to say how excited I was to find out that you guys were doing a podcast for Stranger Things. I really, really love this show. I first started watching the show a few weeks after it had um, dropped on Netflix. I had seen quite a few of my friends on Facebook give reviews of it, and it all seemed something right up my alley. My wife um, had watched the first couple episodes and recommended it for me. One night while she was working, I decided to put it on, and went immediately upstairs and asked her if we could watch the rest. And I had to, uh, unfortunately wait for her for another day or two. Uh, but we, wa- uh, binge watched the rest of the season and just loved it. So my wife and many other people on Facebook had commented that it really resembled the Goonies and ET poltergeist, the X-Files, things that I all really loved. And, you know, growing up in the 80s, that was definitely part of my childhood. And I love, really, really loved how they have been able to replicate the 80s. Uh, you know, just thinking of the the phone with the super long cord stretching into multiple rooms as far as you know the the actors, um, I knew Winona Ryder, uh, the sheriff. I was like watching him, watching him, watching him. Couldn't quite place it, and we, my wife and I, finally realized that uh, he was he played a news anchor on uh, the HBO show The Newsroom. You know, thought he was uh, great in that, and you know, loved him even way more in. Stranger Things, but Millie Bobby Brown, um, I love her in this. And as I was watching her, you know, with the the shaved head, it was really hard to to place where I had seen her before. But I had watched um, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, and she played the young version of Alice. And, you know, I thought she was excellent in that show. And, you know, her performance in Stranger Things just, you know, has blown me away. Looking at um, replicating the 80s, uh, the song choices in, in the series is just absolutely amazing and takes me back to 
my younger days. So speaking of music, I know Daryl and uh, many listeners who have uh, heard the Stuff I Learned Yesterday podcast know that I am a huge fan of the band Tool. They have a song called Jimmy that has uh, relevant lyrics to Stranger Things. The song came out in 1996, so it's it's just odd the coincidence uh, in the song. So in the song, uh, the singer is referring to his childhood, and um, but uh, speaks of Eleven as being a character. And as soon as uh, Stranger Things became part of the social consciousness, uh, a lot of people in the Tool community on Facebook had uh, made the connections with the song. And lots of memes started appearing, and I'm going to be posting one that has uh, some of the lyrics on there. And I wanted to... Uh, add this feedback as a preface to the meme that I'm going to post as well as a fan made video. Uh, the video does include stuff uh, through the entire first season, all footage from the show cut to the music of the song Jimmy. And it's so, so awesome. Here's just a short clip of the song with the lyrics that are in the meme that I'm posting. forward to season two and uh, hoping that uh, you'll continue podcasting and I also wanted to to add uh, I don't I don't know if this uh, how this will be taken Addy but you totally remind me of listening to your mom on the uh, we have to go back lost podcast uh, your voice is starting to match hers and you know minus the uh, the Texas accent uh, uh, just really loving you know, the the family dynamics of of the podcasting and looking forward to hearing more in the future until then this is Jason in San Jose namaste all right thank you Jason thanks Jason we got a big kick out of your feedback. We, uh, I told Carrie about it because oh, Jason sent it over last night and I listened to it just shortly before going to bed. And so I told Carrie about it right when we were going to bed and uh, she thought it was kind of funny. And then at dinner tonight, I actually pulled it out and played it for the whole family. Everyone got a big kick out of it, then, particularly the part where we, we were watching Addie's face when he says... You know, you're starting to sound like your mom because we tease Carrie pretty much relentlessly about her <laughs> accent. So we were Carrie and I were watching Addie's face to see how she would react between that time where Jason said you're starting to sound like your mom, and then before he said it without the Texas accent, and it was perfect, Jason. It was a great setup. <laughs> her face was like. What? No way. To Oh, okay. <laughs> Glad he cleared that up. Um wouldn't want to be too much like her. Oh, uh, your mom's great. Ugh, You'll love. do well if you end up like her. Yeah, I don't I, I was going to say something. Oh, Jason, you pronoun- you mispronounced Mame. <laughs> Meme. He said it right. I don't think he did. All right. Good stuff. And that meme is over on our Facebook page uh, with 11 and the lyrics to the Tool song. So really cool stuff. In fact, I picked Jason's brain after episode six because there was a painting in Mr. Clark's house when the creepy lab rat lady showed up at his house. And there's a, there's a painting on the back wall that looks like a Renaissance era painting. And the only thing I could find about it was from a, like a black metal 
band called Heathen. And it's like, it's the artwork to one of their albums, even though it looks like it's an old, an old Renaissance painting. So I don't know. I don't know where they got the artwork from. It was, if it was something that was originally created for their album, I couldn't find any other reference to it, but that can't be in there by mistake. If there's a, a death metal band album cover blown up into like a wall size painting framed with a fancy frame on Mr. Clark's wall. There has to be something to this. So I picked Jason's brain knowing that he likes tool and he has more knowledge of that genre of music than I do, but he was, he was drawn a blank as well. So if you're listening and you've got some insight on that, that was again in episode seven, um, no episode six rather than uh, they don't let us know. But anyway, glad to hear from Jason and uh, get his thoughts on the show. You ready, yep. for, you ready for some more feedback? Sure. All right. Let's hear what Jeff has to say this week. Transmissions from the Upside Down. Hey, Addie and Daryl. This is Jeff calling in about Chapter 7, The Bathtub. I really enjoyed the kind of shout outs to Fringe with the sensory deprivation tank and L being uh, able to use that to kind of locate Barb um, and see what kind of state she was in and then see what kind of state Will was in. It's just interesting to me that he survived longer than Barb. Um, I know Barb was cut and it was more of a direct attack and his was not so, but it still makes me question um, how he lasted that long. Um, but I really enjoyed seeing the two groups kind of form into one to try to get Will back and everybody start working together so well um, and not having any secrets uh, among the group. But I really enjoyed the episode. Uh, I'm sad to say that we've only got one more chapter left before the fall, um, but I'm really enjoying y'all's podcast and keep up the good work. X-Force 11 out. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. We also got uh, this comment that came in via our Facebook group, which again is facebook.com slash groups slash Stranger Things GSM. And it comes in from Hannah. And she says, I just listened to last episode of the podcast again. And I think it's cool slash kind of funny that Daryl will talk about a dark room or something that us 25 plus year old folks totally get. And Addie is too young to really understand But then she'll come back with a full-on reference to Twilight Zone or Twin Peaks that, if I'm wrong, is even before my time of almost 30 years, and I don't know the reference, too. Great podcast, you guys. Wish I had another episode now to tune into on my way to Nanny. She's a a full-time nanny, so So, uh, that's a nice compliment she's giving you there. Thank you. And you met Hannah when we were in Chicago. Yeah, I remember her. Yep, she's really cool. Um, So thanks, Hannah. Appreciate that. All right, well, that is it for the feedback segment this week. So just as I mentioned last week, since we're winding down our episode review period here of these episodes, uh, we still want to hear from you. We're going to be doing uh, another episode before season two starts, and we would love to have your thoughts and predictions for that. Thoughts on season one, predictions into season two as part of that episode. So Addison, tell them how they can send in feedback for that episode. If you would like to send in your feedback, you can send in your feedback by calling 304-837-2278 and it'll go straight to voicemail and you can leave your um, feedback there. Or you can go to goldenspiralmedia.com and you can upload an audio file or use a speak pipe widget or type one out. So yeah. <laughs> not bad at all and, uh, you, and I know you'll even there's a lot of information right there so you did really good for your, especially for your first time but this is not your first time to give out our social media information so lay it on us alright our Instagram is Stranger Things GSM our Twitter is Upside Down GSM and our Facebook is facebook.com slash groups slash Stranger Things GSM I always say the Facebook one so fast I feel like I'm going to mess up but I haven't yet that was pretty fast 
but I do it fast every time. So Okay. Well, speaking of doing things fast, how about the quote of the week? How's that have to do with anything fast? It's a fake segue. We've had this discussion before. All right. So our quote of the week is from Mike Wheeler and it's the scene whenever um the dudes are outside and his mom's on the phone and he uh, it's right after Justin says we have to leave right now and he says the quote of the week which is if anybody asks where I am I've left the country I don't understand what is there something wrong no, in the house Do I need to call my house one second Mark we need to leave right now Michael if anyone asks where I am, I've left the country. What? I'm glad you chose that scene. It was one of my favorites for sure. And especially when thinking about a quote to go along with it. So nice job. Yeah. My two favorite people are in the same room. Mike and Dustin. Yep. What about L? Oh, well. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, I mean, she's, she's my favorite girl character. Okay. All right. Well, let's move into predictions. Okay, so I've got one prediction this week. And again, I just want to remind you, Addy, next week, you're going to be on equal footing with me. So we need to hear some predictions from you. I've had some predictions. Okay. Well, you may need to remind me of what those were because I forget things. I haven't told you them yet. Oh, okay. Well, good. I didn't forget them then. For this week, here's my prediction. You forgot whether or not I've told you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. Um I think, I just thought it was really weird. We've talked a lot about how Hopper is a pretty good cop, a really good cop. And he's done a lot of smart things. We talked about in this episode how they did some smart things. So for him to break into the lab was really risky. It was risky for him to do it the first time. And he got caught the first time. I think he was, that he was thinking if he can get to the lab, he can get to the hole in the wall and go to the upside down. Because that's probably the only way he knows how to get to the upside down. But it just seemed really dumb to just go almost like barge. Like they weren't really being that sneaky. Especially so, whenever he had Joyce with him. You think he would be even more careful. Right. Yeah. So I think that getting captured was part of his plan. I don't know how that works in his plan because you would assume they're going to put you in some sort of cell or do something to confine you. But I still think that getting captured was, was part of his plan. Otherwise, he turned into a dumb cop all of a sudden, which is disappointing in terms of the writing of the show. But it, I don't think it matters because I think, I still say that Will Byers is coming back to the right side up next week. And, but I think Jonathan and Nancy will be the ones that will rescue him. That's my prediction. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to find out in just a few minutes because we're almost done and I'm going to watch it. Now it's time for the meme of the week. So anyway. The meme we- of the week? <sighs> I said it fast so you wouldn't say it. All right. So it's a picture of Will, Will Byers' face photoshopped over Will Smith's face from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And the caption is, now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. I like, I like it. it. it just sit right there. So you have a human prince of a town called brother. Do, 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 do. But this is what I was saying earlier, where it could be Brennan. Brenner, Brenner. Sorry, Brenner. And he could say, now this is a story all about how my van got flipped, turned upside down. Huh? See, it works that way too. You're not funny. I think it's pretty funny. N- no. I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. I guess we'll just have to agree that I'm right and you're not. Okay. And that, my friends, is going to bring us to a close. Once again, you can follow us on Instagram at Stranger Things GSM, Twitter, Upside Down GSM, or Facebook.com slash groups slash Stranger Things GSM. We would love to uh, just open the floodgates now of feedback now that I am 
going to be spoiler free now. I'm, I'm caught up essentially by the time this podcast comes out. Certainly I will be. And I'd uh, love to just have open dialogue about the show. So join us over there. And uh, we should be a, a lot more active now that we can, like, I can go search out memes and search out news articles and tweet about those you things. You said it right. I know how to say it right. I just do it to annoy you. So I'm looking forward to being uh, unsaddled with this burden of trying to stay spoiler free. It's awesome. It's also awesome that you have joined us for this episode. We hope you'll join us next week for episode eight. And as always, stay strange. <laughs>